Hello, my friends. Thank you for joining me at Evolutionary Energy Arts once again. So what you are looking at here is something called the South Atlantic Anomaly. And this is an area of basically where the shields are going down, as we've been speaking about. It's a dip in the Earth's magnetic field, which allows cosmic rays and charged particles to reach lower into the atmosphere and interfere with communications, satellites, aircraft, even the space shuttle. The geological origin is not known yet. The enhanced particle flux in the SAA is also strongly affecting the X-ray detectors, which in essence are particle detectors. And more than that, it, it affects us on a deep biological, emotional, and basically in every way that you can imagine. <clears throat> and humans that are especially traveling in airplanes in this area are getting bombarded by tremendous levels of radiation. And when you have what we have going on right now, which is the beginnings of a pole shift, this area will probably grow more, most likely, and there may be other areas similar to this that develop across the planet, especially in the Arctic and the Ant Antarctic areas. So there's going to be increased radiation coming in. And one of the things I was going to touch on real quick is it looks like we're returning to a more normal pattern in the uh, Arctic as far as the polar vortex goes, although it is definitely cooling down. Whereas we had incredibly unusual warm temperatures at, at the actual uh, physical North Pole um, that were just totally bizarre. It's gone back to a more normal 25 to 30 below zero. And the cool weather is spreading deeply down into especially Eurasia and also into Canada and dipping into the United States. And so... You know, there's only thing that's constant is change. And we could see that, you know, winter is very much with us and will be with us quite a while. We have very, very cold temps down below in Antarctica. And actually, it's been a very cool summer in many places in the southern hemisphere. As we see some of the temps in Antarctica of a good solid 51 degrees below zero, 52 degrees below zero. So wild weather, wild weather, incredible really. And we know we're heading into at least a little ice age, if not something much, much more. And in the UK, they actually had to call the armed forces in to help as the death toll rises to 10 in the coldest spring day on record. Just um, pretty wild stuff. And unfortunately, or you know, however you look at it, unless you really like extreme cold weather, it's going to be sticking around, and, and not just for the remainder of this winter, but this is going to be something that is just a prelude to the new norm. And this was something from uh, the last day of February saying that in this small Montana city, they were gonna set the record for the coldest February ever unless they hit 108 degrees that day and, and they didn't. So coldest February ever. And we still have water disappearing in different areas. Now, the question is, was this due to the northeaster and this is down in North Carolina and Pamlico and Noose Rivers just completely dry and also some locations in South Carolina experienced the same thing and so the scientists would say it mo more than likely is due to the high winds and the northeaster that we had but there are still reports coming in from all over the world of these dried riverbeds and just, you know, a lot of water anomalies going on. And it could have to do with the magneticism of the, or the, the Earth itself because we are going through a pole shift. And that is something that is happening. And the mainstream scientists are jumping on board and 
you know, they're now kind of warning us. Now, most of the mainstream scientists are saying, you know, don't fear crustal displacement and things along those lines. Don't fear a 2012 scenario, the movie 2012, where you had tidal waves that reached up to Mount Everest. Don't fear that type of thing, but do realize that our entire power grid could be gone, you know, for long periods of time and then come up and then go back down. Satellites for sure disrupted, if not completely fried. Uh, all sorts of things like that. So there has been a report uh, done by scientists at Rochester University that concluded that changes in the strength of the magnetic field observed in the South Atlantic anomaly could portend a quick coup of the magnetic poles of the Earth. So what they're saying is that it appears that repeatedly not just this time but in the past it's been that area that experiences the pole shift first so the south atlantic anomaly is the signal that the pole shift is underway and sometimes you'll have like what they call pole wandering where it doesn't shift totally and and actually it's way overdue as we've said it should go every 200,000 years roughly and it's pushing 800,000 now so we are like so far overdue um, that you know it's, it's really very interesting that it hasn't happened in so long but it's deteriorating very very fast and right now at a rate of we're losing the magnetosphere at a rate of 5% per decade and that could speed up because it has sped up and so now scientists are saying, yes, it appears that the South Atlantic anomaly is the sign that w you know we are going through a pole shift. It's perhaps the first sign of change of the poles. And as the field deteriorates, it might not really be possible for people to stay there because there's going to be so much uh, UV radiation pouring in and so there's so many articles out on this now in the last few days scientists may have found the birthplace of magnetic field reversals and again it's the South Atlantic anomaly and um, it's going to cause tremendous change in the entire planet because as the magnetosphere goes down the UV radiation goes up and it's just going to wreak havoc with many, many things. Right now, there's a lot of people out there that are getting very savvy, and they're checking, because you, you could buy on Amazon uh, detectors to check the UV radiation where you are. And down here in Florida, and conversely over in Texas and Arizona, uh, typically this time of year, you might see a reading of around a 6, and most places have been reading around 10, 10 or 11. So significantly higher than usual and that's only going to increase so just be aware of that you know and and some will say well wear long sleeve clothing even in the hot weather try to keep you know yourself not exposed to the sun and then there are some that might say we need to expose to the sun but do it knowingly and consciously because this could be the trigger in our evolution. So this is something you're going to have to search out the truth for yourself. New data helps explain recent fluctuations in Earth's magnetic field. So the mainstream is catching up with it. And out of Berkeley news, increased UV from ozone depletion sterilizes trees. So that's an interesting study going on there talking about during the planet's largest mass extinction when uh, exposed to the ultraviolet radi radiation as the shields go down as we say the magnetosphere decreases it temporarily made some of the trees sterile and remember the studies that I have pointed out in other videos talking about the increase in well, the decrease in fertility, the increase in the infertility rates, 
And I do feel like a lot of that is due to GMOs and all sorts of stuff that we're bombarded with in our world that causes us to need to constantly be cleansing ourselves. We need to constantly be doing cleanses, um, juice fasts, things along those lines in order to clean our system from just all the chemicals and everything that is you know, all around us at all the time. But perhaps, you know, some of the reason for the increase in infertility is also related to the increase in the radiation that's going on around us. And so this particular study was saying that the trees themselves were affected. It's very, very interesting. And as I was saying, um, down there in Australia, New Zealand, they've had a relatively cool summer it hasn't been that toasty down there and you know actually it you know in some cases it's been a, a record cool summer yet the uv has been extremely high even with these cooler temperatures the uv has been increasing so it's something to be aware of because it could cause cancer increases, as obviously. And uh, it's one of the things when we step outside and it's abnormally cool, you don't automatically think about, you know, putting on some protection. And I personally steer clear of all the big, cheap suntan lotions because they have so many chemicals in there and some of those chemicals could cause issues themselves. So just plain old zinc oxide and, and some other natural um, solutions is what I would stick to personally. So UV radiation causing two neighboring pyramiding bases to bind to each other. So what we're talking about is damage coming to the DNA by UV radiation that can cause mutations. And now, when we think of working out, when we work out and we lift weights or we do resistance exercise, we are actually causing damage. And the damage gets repaired and the muscles get stronger. So that is kind of a natural progression. So we don't have to, and we should not, be f completely fearful. We just need to be aware and pay attention. But so much of everything is mindset so much of everything is intention and mindset and it's it's how we view things and we have a lot of ability a lot of power within us to change something that's potentially negative into a positive so mu mutations can be caused by mutagens a physical or chemical cause of mutation example uv light radiation drugs benzene mutagens are often also carcinogens anything that can cause cancer can be natural random events mutations occur in one one hundred thousandth of dna replications mutations do not have to be bad think in terms of evolution so Again, something to keep in mind with what is going on because we are going to be b bombarded with tons of energy. Many of my friends, subscribers have hit me up with, you know, what is going on today, uh, texts and emails saying that they're feeling really weird, really funky, just had to lay down and then they'll come back up and they'll feel all of a sudden supercharged when they take a little power nap. Or they'll feel like they have to get into the sun. Sometimes they feel like they have to get out of the sun. But just getting hit with all these weird energies. And that's because we are getting bombarded with weird energies. Unusual energies. We know the human race has gone through many mutations. And some have been natural. Some have been induced. And at least that is what I believe going through the history you know, some things have happened naturally and some things have been, you know, planned mutations. And 
genetic experiments as well. And so change is always the only thing we could count on because nothing in this universe ever stays the same. Everything is always changing. It's always evolving. It's always mutating. It's changing from one form to another. As we know, energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only change forms. And so we are being bombarded with changing energy, strengthening energy, or it could be destructive. It, it, it's going to depend on probably the individual as well as where you are located, what you're taking into your body, what you're taking into your mind energetically. We know there has been tremendous change over the millions of years and during human evolution. So what is next? That's the big question. There are so many traditions that speak of what what time we are in and what's coming next and they say that if you if you are familiar with Blavatsky's work and and some of the other ones they talk about different root races how there are different what is conceived to be a root race is basically like a new genetic form a new type of human that emerges and this happens regularly. There's humans are always changing and evolving and evolving towards a higher state of development, a higher state of being. And so now is the time when, according to many sources, new root races are going to emerge. And we are going to evolve into something different something more multi-dimensional and again like tesla had spoken about if you want to know the secrets of the universe you have to think in terms of vibration and frequency everything is energy you know and we will be expanding our consciousness and perceiving things in a greater frequency band than what we perceive at the moment so these energies that are coming in are triggering mutations and some view it as our DNA with 97% junk material quote unquote is being reactivated and the junk material is not going to be junk anymore but it's going to be turned back on because it was turned off at some point and when it is turned back on instead of just being on one little frequency think of it in terms of a radio channel and your reality is just one station well now all of a sudden you're gonna be able to hear three four five six stations at once and so it could be very confusing at first and people that have kundalini experiences of which I I know several and where their kundalini their their evolutionary energy has risen from the base of the spine and it's changed their DNA it's transformed them in so that they could all of a sudden now see energy they could see beings on other dimensions that they couldn't see before and so it could be very disconcerting and sometimes the energy fluxes can really play with you and exhaust you and wipe you out or leave you hypercharged and supercharged where you can't sleep for days on end so there's a lot of processing that needs to take place and really people are being guided right now and I, I know tons of them that are being guided by their intuition to change their diet. Some, many, are giving up meat altogether and gravitating towards a vegan diet. And then there are some that might even have been vegan and then all of a sudden I need some fish or something because it's happening so fast in them because a vegan diet and a vegetarian diet and a live food diet in particular will speed up the process. And sometimes it could be happening so fast that you will almost feel like you're going to go crazy unless you ground yourself. So you could ground yourself by, you know, eating something that's a little bit lower vibrational, such as fish or meat. So there's times when people will feel like they need that because it's going to pull them back to this reality a little bit more. And everybody is unique and, you know, it's not that anybody is crazy. 
Everybody is unique. You have your own perspective. You're going through your own changes. The one thing I would definitely recommend, though, is adopt a regular pattern of cleansing, whether it's you know a three-day fast every month, a one-day fast every week. Maybe I know one of one of my good friends. He he basically has his clients basically have one day where all they eat is fruit and that gives their system a break you could do it by intermittent fasting which is a wonderful way to clear out those carcinogenic cells when our body is not taking in food for over 12 hours it starts to break down first material that is not healthy so the first material the body will break down will be anything that is carcinogenic anything that is not helping it so this is an automatic way of cleansing ourselves of cancerous cells and many other techniques you could do as well but intermittent fasting usually people will eat in say a 16 hour window something along those lines so you might eat just say from noon till eight o'clock or ten o'clock till six o'clock something along those lines some people will push it more I myself was doing 20 hours without eating and just eating in a four hour window between two and six. And uh, it definitely sped along the processes. You feel much lighter, quicker, as far as your mental clarity and all. And so this is something that you have to work with on your own, but realize that it's necessary to detox, to cleanse in this environment with the increased energy and just with all the crap that is around us. You know, all the GMOs, all the pesticides that are sprayed everywhere, the chemtrails in the sky. We must constantly be cleansing. We need to take the load off of our livers, off of our kidneys, off of the spleen, you know, and help these things help them function and with the increased energy coming in it's it's more imperative than ever and so as we evolve some say we're going to become light body beings and light bodies is also known as a merkaba and in the kabbalistic tradition comes out of judaism and in tibet they speak of the rainbow body and many many monks achieve the rainbow body just through regular meditation where they will be in meditation and then the people will come in and their clothes are there but they're gone sometimes they leave just the hair and the nails um, sometimes the body starts to just simply shrink and it's it's just crazy and i've talked about this in other videos I do have a video out on Ascension, if you guys would check that out. I think it's so important and I want everybody to be aware of what's going on because this is something that's been talked about in many, many, many traditions all over the world. And it's part of what's going on with the pole reversal. The pole reversal is going to trigger energetic changes in us and so we must know how to prepare physically, mentally, emotionally because it doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. It is the trigger for a new stage in evol evolution, for human evolution, in my opinion. And I encourage you guys to look into things deeper. As always, please hit the like button and share as much as possible. Let's wake up as many people to what's going on. The changes are real, the changes are here. And so it's how we address it and how we personally adapt to it and how we take it as an opportunity for personal growth. As always, there's no fear. Fear is the inhibitor. But awareness, preparation, and knowing. And we will get through this and we will come out better and stronger on the other side. So as always, I wish you guys love and no fear, as we said. Have a plan, be prepared, and share. And if you haven't subscribed, definitely subscribe and get more updates that way. I thank you all for your support. Take care, my friends. And 213. What the heck was that? There's well, our sun could that just right be, there. You know, could that just be some type of camera anomaly or some type of lens nope. flare?
Nope. Nope. I'm sorry, I'll keep saying that. There it is. What do you think that is? I have no idea. Honestly, I don't. And I'm not going to sit here and BS your listeners. Here's the ships that have been showing up. 2003. 2004. There is that big can you, can thing. Can you make those a little bit bigger? Needs... Yeah, hold on a sec. Uh, to make it larger, right there. There we Look go. At... That's great. Look at that thing. Now, up until sometime in, 2000, in 2011, all these things were seen coming around our sun. That's our sun right there. They were either heading towards our sun or going away from our set, heading towards us. You know, that reminds me of that new Stargate series that came out several years ago, where Stargate Universe, I think, where they were in some ship that was of an alien technology, and they were able to basically take— You see this one? But i I got to bring this up real quick, because what these ships would do— is they would go into the sun and harness its energy, so it was almost like <laughs> fuel. I have an excellent. See, I uh, my my friend at NASA. Here's one of these ships shooting the beam of energy at something. This thing is the size of our planet. I spoke at UFO Con 213, and I showed these images. There it is again. Look at that beam. Yeah, Look that's that insane, beam. man. That and it is. How, how can you not? I mean, it almost looks too good to be true. It literally looks like somebody could have went into Photoshop and just changed it the does. color of those pixels. But these are all images directly off the Soho web page. See, Soho camera has about ten different cameras. And each one is taking photographs at about 15-minute intervals. And not one of them takes a photograph at the same time. Now, so, now they've been, I, I've been told by SOHO that solar stuff from the sun cannot hit two cameras at once. So if it hits one camera, it scatters the entire image. Now, these images are very clear. They're not scattered. It's 2005. Soho says that all the glitches were fixed on all of their cameras by 2012. Okay? Okay. Sure. I've got the I've got these images all the way up until today. So, and that one picture right now, you know, they seem to all have a very similar outline. Yes, I'm, they do. And I'm coming up on on see like that it. one right there. That's that thing is ginormous. Okay. And how it is. And I'll show you how large it is real soon. Let me get to it real fast. One photograph after the other after the other. Come on, 2005, we're getting very close. And that last one there is one that's, that looks like it turned on its cloaking device, where only part of it was being, it was disappearing. Okay. Same basic thing, over and over. Look at that. Look at that beam. Now, I showed these to a military friend, can't mention what or who or how high he was, and he wanted to look at these images, the images of these things firing something, and he took them to work with him, and he put it under 
different types of stuff. Wow. That <laughs> one you've got on right now is just right there. 2005. This is from the Soho EIT 304 Ultra Violet camera. Now look at that thing right there coming down the left hand side of our sun. You know, it just reminds me of that end of the movie Men and in there Black. There it is, enlarged. Yeah. It reminds me of that movie Men in Black at the very end where they open up a locker and the locker is basically opens up an, another portal. Anyway, it's just so fantastic, this information oh, yes. you're bringing out. You know, and, and NASA's been filming this stuff for years, okay? Now, everyone tried to say, oh, it's not real, it's this, it's that. I even had people from MUFON tell me this is all BS. And they gave me one excuse after another after another. What were their excuses? That it was all garbage. I was faking all this. Now, this is from the U.S. Navy's Sechi camera. Now, I went on to the Sechi pages, and I was looking through all their photographs, and not one of these photographs were still there. They had deleted every single one. Where, look at those. Stay, stay at that one right there. Let's look at go. all these things. What is this? What in this the world is, is this? This is from the U.S. Navy's Sechi. Now, this is either from stereo ahead or stereo behind. It looks they, like a Red Hot Chili Peppers radio they, cover. Ever since 2007, remember I told you that NASA, I showed you the images, that NASA photographed the brown dwarf star we call Nemesis at six planets? As of 2008, all these things start showing up on the different things. On stereo ahead, stereo behind, on the Sechi, on the Soho cameras. It looks like they're doing, like, you know, hey, we're here. Okay? And this is what they all look like. And I have numerous photographs like that. Look at all these things going zip, zip, zip. Left and right. I mean, it, it's almost as if these pictures that you're showing us here, they look like total, it seriously looks like a Photoshop, Robert. It looks like somebody went in there and had a just a, a, a good old time putting all these strange white circles and etc. I wish it was. Seriously, I wish it was. Okay? But you're seeing... What I took directly off the cameras. This is from Stereo Head, 2009. Yeah, what's this? I mean, these things are huge. If they're, these, if they're this, do you think that that's in scale compared to the sun? If you look at the sun in the, the middle sun, there? That's the sun right there. Yeah. Is that in scale? Okay, let me show you another one. Now, I was told that this is all star this, it's all star that, and it's all BS, and it's not to be believed, okay? See, our ET friends, they've been working on this for a long time. They knew that this stuff was going to be coming through, and they've been setting us up, okay? 2011. That's a ship coming out of what I call warp. A huge blast and quickly decelerating. Now, this is a photograph that my friend at NASA checked out and said this was real. It was no Photoshop, no nothing. 
because there's the image right there. Right there. There's the sun. There's the image. And here's the enlargement. Here's the original image. Right there. Just like Star Trek. A huge blast and zoom, comes flying out of warp. It's quickly decelerating. So this one camera, it caught it from that angle. Here's another one. This one is showing one of the ships firing at something. There it is right there. Wow. You know, even on Yahoo, there was a article that came out a few years ago, a couple years ago, that showed here's a, here's something another, similar to this. I'm sorry. Here's another ship coming out of warp. Big flash. Quickly decelerating. There it is right there. No Photoshop, no nothing. Okay, the ETs, like I said, have been on our side. They want us to survive this time around. The last time around, the pull shifts depopulated the planet. Seriously depopulated. Now, I know you talked to Marshall Masters about the Georgia Guidestones where it says, never let the population go above 500 million again. Interesting. You see, the, the Templars and the Hospitallers were created back in 1180-something. I forgot the exact date. The Pope told them to use a very certain image on their clothes. The eight-point cross. I had to track that cross back because a friend of mine put this really nice... Have you ever seen a lot of the wall carvings of the Anunnaki? Oh, yeah. Okay. He, showed, he put one of these pictures on his Facebook page showing an Anunnaki that I'd never seen before. He is on the wall. He's pointing up to something. I sent you the photograph. He's pointing to something. But on his chest, he has a, a chain. And the chain goes down to a round circle with an eight-pointed cross in the center of it. So I had to research. See, my wife and I, we went to the island of Malta last year. That's where her parents came from after World War II. And you can't go nowhere on Malta without seeing the Maltese cross. And here's this Anunnaki wearing the Maltese cross. That image showed the mark of Cain. When Cain killed Abel, he was marked. And he was put to the other side of the planet. And in the Holy Bible, Cain had a family. Wait, hold on a second. You only have Adam, Eve, and Abel. Who's Cain having a family with? Okay? I'm not knocking anyone's religion. But too many questions. When you dig back through ancient history, 1600, Mosai of China. Mosai of China, a lot of the ancient stuff was saved. The first Chinese emperor tried, he tried to destroy all of history before him by burning everything. But the writings of Confucius were found and all, all these other stuff. Mosai of China is on Google. M-O-Z-I, Mosai, Book 5. He's talking about three gods who come down and align, and align themselves with one warlord. And to punish the other warlords for not complying, he had stones fall from the sky for almost ten days. 
He had intense heat. He had intense cold hit China. Forest fires. Things were frozen. Doesn't that kind of match up with the uh, account from the Colbrin about Noah's Ark? Feeling intense heat. Feeling intense cold. Okay. 1600. The exodus of the Hyksos out of Egypt. The Hyksos were a Canaanite people who ruled Upper Egypt from the 12th Egyptian dynasty to the end of the 17th Egyptian dynasty. Ipuwer, I-P-U-W-E-R, was an Egyptian scribe. They were highly trained, and they passed everything from the palace on down to the people. He documented the exodus of the slaves and evildoers from Egypt. The slaves, whomever they were, the evildoers were the Egyptians who latched on to the slaves and left Egypt. His entire account details, he says that the dark days started when the destroyer showed up. They called it the destroyer, a reddish mass which took up to one-fifth of the skies over Egypt. They were hearing the sound of 10,000 trumpets. And the destroyer rained down fire onto the earth. The fire destroyed everything that grew. Fields, forests, uh, uh, and vines where they had nothing to eat. The Hyksos Pharaoh went after them. They were led by a priest prince from the inner courtyard of Pharaoh. Okay? Pharaoh, and during this time, volcanic ash was falling over Egypt. They were led up to the saltwater marsh where they were stopped because of the salt water. They couldn't, they were fighting amongst themselves. Pharaoh is going through town after town after town where everything was destroyed. All the tablets that told who owned who were broken. All the granaries were looted. Caught up with them. He started to go after them. They heard a tremendous roar in the sky. The ocean went away from the shoreline. While they were fighting, the ocean came flying back in, throwing rocks and stuff on top of them and killing Pharaoh. And the survivors said that the slaves and evildoers died from the fire and the water. Okay. Because volcanic ash was falling, I had to check out which volcano was erupting at that time. The island, the Greek island of Thera, now called Santorini, blew itself apart. And something happened. Ippur went on to say that during this exodus, the stars in the sky shifted to new positions. The sun and the moon had new positions where they rose and where they set. And all the seeds they tried to put in the ground to grow rotted within the ground. Then he goes on to say 
that the destroyer had been in the sky twice before. It had actually struck the planet Earth once or twice, and that the water that the land had been swept clean by the oceans twice. Herodotus, one of the ancient Greek people, also said that the sun had set in different positions before. Uh, when Solon went to ancient Egypt and talked to the ancient Egyptian priests, and he talked about the flood, he laughed. they laughed at him saying that the Greeks were just children and that there had been many floods before like that. Okay. Ippower also said that he wished that they had paid attention to the god of the slaves. And he called them the Hebrews. Wow. Okay. Okay. I checked who the Hyksos were. They were Canaanite people. And that the new pharaoh chased the Hyksos up towards what we now call Jerusalem. Okay. Achmos and his brother kicked the Hyksos out of Egypt. Very few people talk about this. It's only been mentioned on ancient aliens recently, but no one's paying attention to it. Achmos became Pharaoh sometime around 1550. So you had the Exodus sometime between 1627 and 1558 BC. Achmos in Hebrew means brother of Moses. The Egyptians don't want to talk about the Hyksos. In fact, they tried to erase them from history. The Egyptian government doesn't want to talk about the Hyksos or the Hebrews because that would mean they're saying, yes, the Israelis are talking correct. The United States won't push the Egyptians on this stuff because that will cause all kinds of world problems. So everyone's keeping it quiet until just recently on a few shows, they're starting to mention it. Now, the destroyer was in the skies during the Exodus. At the end of the Exodus, you had the 18th dynasty started by Achmos I. During the 18th dynasty, you had Akhenaten, the guy with the real, really extended skull and his wife. And every time you see a picture of them, they're all looking at, they're praying to what looks like a sun. I think they're praying to Nibiru. Some people have said Akhenaten was actually Moses. Akmos, brother of Moses. After this took, took place, Akmos created a stella. And on this stella, in Egyptian hieroglyphics, he detailed very clearly what he had to have repaired. And this stella was put down. And eventually it was destroyed and used as filler for something else, and it was found during the 1800s. And they put it back together partially, and they were able to do a chalk, a, a, a carbon drawing of what was written in hieroglyphics. It's called the Tempest Stella of Akmos. And in this stella, he talks about a massive storm that hit Egypt where Egypt was flooded. Egypt was flooded. And all the roads were flooded, bodies all over every place. He had to go by boat going everywhere. And talks about everything that happened. 
And in Egyptian hieroglyphics, he says, the pyramids had collapsed. Okay. All right. So that's almost 3,600 years ago. That's incredible. And exactly. No, hold on, hold on. Pope John Paul II, 1980. He went to Germany. Had a huge group of high-paying Catholics, I'm quite sure. There was also two reporters. And they kept bugging the holy BS out of him about the third secret of Fatima and why it wasn't released in 1960. The Pope finally gave up. He said that the Popes before him wouldn't talk about the third secret of Fatima because they didn't want the communists to have many coups. But... What if it was in writing that the oceans would cover all the continents, killing millions within minutes? Why talk about it? I sent you a copy of that. Anyone can go on to Google and they do a search, Pope John Paul II and the Third Secret of Fatima. They, they go right to it. The Vatican tried to downplay it. 1981, Pope John Paul II was almost killed. After he recovered, he went to the cell of the almost assassin and spent two hours alone with him, off the record. He never never mentioned this warning again. Okay? 1983, the Irish satellite spots something very large out beyond Pluto. They said it was between four to eight times the size of the planet Earth. But then NASA... Now, I'm sorry, these guys didn't know what they're talking about. Sorry, we're, we're, we're pulling the story. NASA put Robert... S. Harrington from the Naval Institute in charge of a team of scientists. He actually put down in writing that Nibiru didn't have an elliptical orbit, had a normal orbit. And he said that the orbit was highly inclined at about 35 to 40 degrees. Remember that image I showed you of Sedna and that huge angle it had? Yeah. Okay. Where it goes down. See, Nibiru goes through our system clockwise. It comes between Jupiter and Mars, goes down and around our sun and back out between Jupiter and Mars. We, in our orbit, we orbit, orbit counterclockwise. So just as Marshall Masters has done beautiful videos, free for the public, he's put down one video that shows what if we're in this orbit and it's coming through and we're here, but, but we're maybe on the other side of our solar system. Nothing happens. But if we're here, as it's coming through, bad things happen. We are now orbiting right towards whatever we're seeing in our skies. NASA, uh, the Jesuits, let me get the pictures here for you. The Jesuits have been in charge of all of the observatories around the planet. After 1955, the Jesuits were put in charge of all the observatories. They have the observatory in Arizona and down in Antarctica. 
They've been tracking something for years, but no one could figure out what it was. One of my friends said, Bob, you're full of BS. You don't know what you're talking about. And he said, send me everything you have. So I did. I sent him all the leaked NASA information. And lo and behold, everyone, you remember back in two, December 21st, 2012? Oh, everyone yeah. Everyone said that the world was coming to an end because that was the end of the Aztec calendar. Well, you see, leaked information from NASA in 2009 followed the plant Nibiru. And here's what was produced from it. That little red dot, that's the plant Nibiru. That's plant six in the Nemesis star system. And the leaked information allowed them to follow it from 2009 till December 21st, 2012. There you go, June 2010, 2010, 2011, 2011, 2012, June of 2012, and there's December 2012. We didn't see anything on December 2012. Well, let me put you in on this. In 2009, NASA predicted that on December 21st, 2012, Nibiru would be 20 astronomical units away from going through our solar system. 20 AUs away. An astronomical unit is 93 million miles from the Earth to the Sun. Times that by 20. That's a big distance away. So they knew we wouldn't see a thing on December 24th. But my astronomer friend said, whoa, hold on here, Bob. I've now worked out the orbital speed of Nibiru. You're not going to see this until at least November, December of 2014. And you see all these nice people, as you mentioned, around the planet were seeing twin suns. And everyone said, no, that's not true. This is all digital camera bullshit BS. Don't pay any attention to them. Okay. So we all started to see things in two thousand. And these are all the images. Now down in Antarctica you have the new Meyer station. Look at all these nice things. Nice pictures. Early two thousand fifteen. We're, people are seeing this all around the world, and some of them are taking different camera angles where it's reversed, saying, yes, there's something there. It's not BS. And we go all the way up until April 10th, 2015. See, here's Antarctica. That's April 5th. New Mars Station. Whoa, what's that? They've been watching that thing for years. Here's all the dates right up here. Kind of looks like the moon, though. And that's what a lot of people were thinking. Because everyone was seeing it. There's two suns. Our sun. And there's the other thing. Two suns again. And that thing. Two suns again. 
one tiny thing, all depend on where they saw it around the planet. There's two suns again. Two suns again. Two suns again. Again. Something weird there. Couldn't really make out what that was. Hmm. Two suns again. April 10th. Two suns again. Again. There's a friend of mine, Sharon. She started taking photographs. Wasn't sure what that was was. There's April 10th, Newmire Station. Wow, that thing there is coming into very clue, so you can see stripes on it. There it is enlarged. That's not our moon. It has stripes. April 11th, there's something behind it, right there. And there's that thing right there. Then, there's a really nice enlargement of it. So everyone thought, ah, oh, you're just seeing things, Bob. It's not real. I need to go back and plug, plug this thing back into the power. Power's getting low. Okay, so all your viewers can see that right there, nice and large. But that's over Antarctica. You still there? Oh yeah, I'm looking at it right now, and I'm just trying to figure I, out what exactly well, is that a I'm, planet? Is that some type of moon? Well, I just plugged back into power, so it's not. I won't go dead now, and the laundry machines are. Almost not working. Okay, good. So that's over the skies of Antarctica. Couple more things, couple more things. New Myers Station 11. What is that? Look at that huge thing. Well, couldn't you just say that's the sun? Well, if I had to go by the other images, I'd say no. Now, this was caught by my friend Sharon Havick, Habrick on April 29th. Look at that thing right there in the skies over South Carolina. Stripes. Hmm. Blue sky. No Photoshop. There's that same thing again. Blue sky. There's that thing. That's the same photograph again there. And there's an enlargement of it. See the stripes? Why does it look so transparent? It's in the... Oh, well... Chemtrails. The chemtrails have been trying to hide this from our eyes for years. And the chemtrails are starting to lose their ability to hide it now. They don't want everyone to freak out. The Edgar Casey, the sleeping prophet, 100% on all of his predictions. Before he died in 1945, he started talking about pole shift. He had a map of the United States drawn up, and that map showed the entire west coast was gone, except for many islands. The Great Lakes had ripped all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. The east coast of the United States was almost gone. About 20 something years ago, high ranking military officials that were retiring were given a briefing. They were told to relocate above 4,000 feet. They were given that same map and told to keep quiet about it. These maps have been leaked over and over and over and over again. Now you asked about Apollo, 
the Apollo program. Why didn't the Apollo program know about this stuff? Apollo 17. A friend of mine, Dr. Johnston, was on the Apollo photographic unit. And he was ordered to remove things from the photographs. Apollo 17 goes around the back side of the moon. They were contacted in English and were told to never return to the moon. The Apollo program was canceled. Now, Dr. Kenneth Johnston went on a show a couple years ago and outed all this stuff. So we've known about this thing for a long time. We've known about the Anunnaki. Uh, Colonel Philip Corso talked about it in his book, The Day After Roswell. Numerous other people have talked about it, but no one's listening. My friends over in Europe and in South America, they know that there has been a massive disinformation program here in the United States and Canada. We're not talking about this stuff. Now, I have to be honest. Why? T seriously, like in the movie 2012, why talk about it? You have panic. Hollywood has been warning us for years. The movie ID4, Independence Day, outed the part about the president being out of the loop of Area 51 and the aliens. The movie Deep Impact with Morgan Freeman outed the part about the deep underground military bases, the dumbs, and that they can only hold so many people, and that everyone else on the surface would be on their own. Now, I sent you a photograph of the comet Elenin. Now, my same friend from NASA, we tracked that comet. NASA never gave an official photograph of Elenin. And it was a good-sized comet. Only the amateur astronomers talked about it. There it is, Elenin. And there it is right there. There it is. Extinction level event. Mm, just hold on a minute. You don't know how close you came to that. Ah, over in Russia, during the Elenin stuff, an article said that Elenin was in direct communications with a Jupiter-sized planet that was far behind it and it was coming. So my friend at NASA started to enlarge the images. And we got some interesting stuff here. That's Elenin right there. Let me enlarge that photograph for you. Okay, that's Elenin. Now, not too long after that article hit the news services, China came out with an article saying that alien spaceships were piggybacked on Elenin and were heading our way. So my friend at NASA said, we both agreed, we're going to start really looking at this thing better and better and better, finer and finer and finer. And you're not going to believe what you see, neither will your readers. All these nice images. Here's Elenin, enlarged. Stupid laptop PC. 
Where is that image? I think technology is against me sometimes. And he had something really not too good to show me. Ellen was not traveling on its own. It had something on both sides of it, port and starboard. And they were traveling with it as it was coming in. And then we decided to, he, he just, all these photographs are from him. And that's the guy at NASA. And now my machine decides to act up. <laughs> that's usually how it goes here. I know. Remember the article about the Chinese saying something? Yes. Was piggybacked oh, on, yeah. top of, on top of Ellen? Okay, that wants to just act up now. That figures. Uh, it's just not loading, is it? No, it's not. It just wants to act up. That is Ellen. Okay? And my friend at NASA had never seen, here we go, an energy search looking like that. That's the comet right there. Look at this force field around the entire thing. Yeah, that's all quite these, odd. All these little gobulets, globulars, were something that was piggybacked on the comet Ellen. Look at this part right here. He could not describe the energy he was seeing in these photographs. There was just no way. Back up here a second. There is enlarged. This was the comet right there. So what do you think it is? As this thing came, it was heading at a downward angle through the, the ecliptic in our solar system. It was thought to, it was going to explode because anything coming into our system is on a different voltage, amperage, versus everything that's in our system. Just before it did, it dispersed. And it dispersed on either side of the comet. And they all disappeared. So I don't know what to tell you what it was. My quark friends were telling me that this comet was far too heavy for a comet. It was on the order of a piece of a star or something. It had a huge amount of mass. It was not a comet, as we know comets as. Well, you know, and I've interviewed Courtney Brown many times. I remember several years ago, I interviewed him, and he talked about what you were discussing, this, you know, catastrophe that might take place because of whatever debris hitting Earth. So, and that never okay. happened. It never okay, happened. Hold, and hold when on. I talk, hold hold on. on a second. That's fine, but I just want to say when I talked to him again sure. about it, he, he expressed that he thought that the government or certain military factions actually – had something to do with that not taking place because of what he discussed. So yeah. I did a show with third third phase of the moon a while back. And I was starting to tell people about the things the ETs put around our sun. Here's Stereo Behind 2011 shows something massive. There's our sun how big that thing is. 
the ETs put massive space probes around our sun, and NASA tried to hide it by erasing the images, but people were following it on a regular basis, and they started sending me the images. They, okay, our sun is now interacting with Nibiru. Nibiru is from a different solar system, the Nemesis star system. It's on a different voltage amperage. Our, everything in our system is on a different voltage amperage. As Nibiru swings through, it's interacting with our sun. Our sun's interacting with Nibiru. It's putting out a whole bunch of stuff. Now, all this stuff causes earthquakes, causes tectonic movements, causes volcanic action. As all of your listeners know, we are now in the highest volcanic activity in human history. We have one volcano after another, after another, after another. And this is exactly what Ippelwurst said during, e during the Exodus, that the ground was heaving, all this stuff was happening. That's why they built deep underground military bases. That's why they built the emergency seed vaults. The seed vaults were outed by a high engineer up in Norway. The seed vaults and the deep underground military bases, he turned politician. And he went out and he, I sent you a copy of this. He said that they were all built because Planet X was coming in. Now, in 2000, early 2000, a high-ranking Jesuit priest was sent out by the Vatican to tell an Italian reporter everything because no one else was talking about it. That was Christopher Barbato. He told everything to his friend, Lucas Gantenberlo, another Italian reporter, who did a video for Project Camelot in 2008 detailing everything that Christopher told him. Yes, the Pope did meet with the Anunnaki. Yes, the Pope did know about Nibiru. Yes, the Pope did know that he described the Anunnaki as a warrior race. Blah, 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 blah. The prophecies of St. Malachi said there was only going to be 112 popes. Pope 111 was going to be from the Benedictine order. Pope Benedict. Pope Benedict retired, the first pope in 600 years to retire early. After he got out, he went on a German radio show and blasted the Jesuits for their alien agenda. I sent you both copies of both articles. What radio show did he do that on? It didn't mention. Neither article mentioned the radio name or show. Pope Francis is the 112th Pope. According to St. Malachi, 112th Pope would be Peter the Roman. Now, all of the movies, 2012, shows the Vatican being destroyed. Pope 112 would be in charge of the Vatican at the time when the seven-hilled city was completely destroyed. Now, I'll tell you, if every government around this planet has dumbs, so do each of the major religions. China has built cities over in Africa they're completely deserted. Beautiful cities. They've also built them up in Upper China, high up. 
we have been sending M1 Abrams tanks for the last two years to be hidden in caves over in Norway. I've got the articles. They were being seen put on roll-on, roll-on ships. And they were heading to Norway. In the movie 2012, the New South Pole was somewhere over in Wisconsin. That would put San Francisco up near the Arctic Circle. It would also put Norway on the opposite side of the planet in nice warm conditions. My astronomer friend said he also did research into the ancient ice cores. He asked me what were all the dates. I gave him the dates just like I just told you earlier. The average pole shift of 23 degrees happened each time. That was also mentioned in the movie 2012. Since the year 2010, many people around the planet have been having nightmares or visions of water hitting the shorelines, a black U.S. president, the hiding times where everyone was hiding from the black helicopters. All those who were picked up were put into prison camps, the FEMA camps. Now, the FEMA camps are interesting. We built and paid for millions of five-person caskets. Five-person caskets. They're all buried out in front of each one of the FEMA camps. Since 2010, 2010 each one of the U.S. government agencies post office on down, have bought millions of rounds of ammunition, guns. Why do they need that? I've seen train cars that usually, there are three layers uh, that carry cars, turned into prison cells. I've seen the pictures on, on, uh, on the internet. Everything says this is coming real soon. The pictures are getting larger and larger in our skies. Ah, uh, I'll give you the latest photograph right here. Came off uh, Facebook today. This was over the this was over the city of Florence, Italy. I showed it to you earlier before we went on the air. It was enhanced. Here's the first photograph. I'll make it larger here. Just barely see a reddish looking thing right here. Right. The person, the person enhanced it. And there's the second enhancement. Now, she also did a video, and I, I put the video... Wow, you can link. definitely see it there. You can see something right there. I put the video link on your uh, Skype page, so you can see the video yourself. It's only like a minute something. And here's where she enhanced it further. This thing has been showing itself over Europe for months now. Look at that. That's insane. It is. And if you clear the sky, what else they're putting in there? That would be very clear. Now, she reversed the image today. Here's this image right there. Massive thing in the skies over Florence, Italy. It's huge. It's ginormous. Now, it were 3,600 almost years ago, 
said that the destroyer took up to one-fifth of the skies over Egypt. Now, we're not that close to it yet. We're orbiting towards it. So that thing will continue to grow larger and larger in our skies. A friend of mine up in Washington, she has a very expensive infrared camera. She's been getting huge infrared images in the skies. That doesn't make any sense, at least to the normal people that aren't following this stuff. But look at that image. That was in the skies over Florence, Italy, just the other day. So what kind of impact is that going to have on We're gonna everyday life? We're going to have a pole life? shift. There's going to be a pole shift. Very quick depopulation. That's why they built all the stuff. That's why they built the emergency seat vaults. The deep underground military base up in uh, Denver, Colorado is fully active. Underneath one of the other, are you there? Oh, yeah. Okay. One of the other mountains up there, they have three. 15-story buildings, 2,000 feet underground. They're fully active. Edgar Casey said the new Pacific shoreline would be in Denver. We're right around there. They have, Denver has the largest emergency seed vault in the United States. So this is potentially something that could happen soon. Within the next couple months, all the indications say somewhere around March, April. You see that thing in the sky right there. That's gotten larger and larger and larger. I don't think that is Nibiru itself. I think that's one of its moons. If Nibiru was four to eight times the size of our planet, its moons are probably just as large, and they probably have a very strong gravitational electromagnetic pull. And if that pull is strong enough, it will pull the crust. In the movie 2012, they talk about this one guy who talked about Earth crustal displacement when they were on board the airplane heading to China. And when the pole shifted, he said, that's what that one guy talked about. Because suddenly they were 1,000 something miles closer to China than they should have been. Now, I know that the militaries on this planet are not going to be as stupid as you saw in the movie 2012. They're going to have everything out at sea. Because whomever has the strongest military after it all settles down will be in charge. It'll be a new world order. Okay, I got to jump in here real quick because yeah, I had the opportunity to speak with Cliff High earlier today. And okay. he is a uh, very fascinating individual he helped uh, he created the web bots that the half past human where basically he's got this software that takes information from the web and correlates it to future events uh, mm -hmm. he predicted Fukushima and many other disasters with his web bot software just incredible and one of the predictions that the web bots are going to are having for 2016 is giant earthquakes and the planet expanding, the planet expanding. So what you're talking about with these pole shifts, etc., it kind of correlates with what his web bots have picked up on the internet. And if this is the year that it's going to happen, you know, I am thinking of 2012, 2011, uh, the Bible, the Holy Bible. I am not a religious person by any means. 
And in the Bible, it does talk about, well, there's going to be a lot of false predictions and then nobody's going to believe when shit really does hit the fan because of all the false predictions beforehand. Exactly, the mass so, disinformation program. So what I am wondering is if all this 2012 stuff was created so when this Nibiru really does show itself, this you know nemesis, people are going to be so numbed to crying wolf previously that they and don't give be a swept shit. Away. They will be swept away. The Hopi said that at the end of the third Hopi world, the ground was heaving just left and right. You could almost not stand up. Now you can believe that. You know, if there's if there's going to be a crust. Crustal displacement shifting over the mantle. And you that's exactly Earth. what Cliff's web bots are talking about this year. Yeah. And every bridge will be down. Anyone that survives will be walking if they're not swept away by water. Pope John Paul II said it very clearly in 1980. What if it was in writing? that the oceans would cover all the continents, killing millions within minutes. Why talk about it? I mean, you know, don't listen to the guy at the end of the street saying, the world is coming to an end. That's Pope John Paul II. The Vatican knows about this. Okay? And if the Vatican knows, I'm quite sure the Jewish... Uh, religion knows that, and so does Muslim religion. And why do you think the other ones? Why do you think the Vatican created this very expensive telescope, and they called it Lucifer? They want to be available when everything settles down. They want to have their religion for the survivors. I'm quite sure the Jewish religion wants the same thing. I'm quite sure the Muslim religion wants the same thing. They all don't want it to all come to an end. But why would they name a telescope Lucifer? <laughs> I honestly can't tell you. But they know it. The Hopi people know it. The Hopi people call it the Red Kachina. The Red Kachina will purify the planet Earth. The Blue Kachina has the Star Brothers. The Star Brothers will come down in the plaza for everyone to see. Not just to Hopi, but for everyone to see, they will take off their mask, showing everyone whom, whom they are. Have you ever seen a picture of the Hopi Kachinas. Most of them have Hopi sitting on the ground, respectfully, and the Kachinas are like eight, nine feet tall above them. And they're like wearing a costume. They take off that mask, showing everyone whom and what they look like. But Right behind the blue kachina is the red kachina. The red kachina will purify the earth. It will sweep the earth clean of all the people that weren't saved. Now the Hopi were always saved by the ant people. They were saved each and every time. They were taken underground or taken somewhere where they came back up later once everything settled down. And they you call them the ant people? Yes. Who do you think the ant people are? I honestly don't know. It could be another race that's living here on the planet. Like I said, ancient astronauts, a couple of the people in there, they say we're talking to at least 50 alien races on a daily basis. Yeah, but when, when they say we are, and I apologize for interrupting because this is fascinating, I just am bringing up what other people that are listening to this podcast might think in their minds. Sure. When you say we're talking to 50 other races, who is where? 
I mean, is that the, you know, ultra D super blue level classified 52nd degree?